And I want to give a quick shout out to Jared. Jared, thanks for hooking the two of us up. Like Cody said, we've never really met, but Cody, I started looking into who you are and what you're doing. And I first want to say thanks for the service to the country that you did for us, man. But I'm really fired up about what you're trying to do in men's lives. So guys, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you would dial in and listen for a few minutes today. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, let me give you a bit about my spiritual background. And uh, I want to, if we have a few minutes, maybe I'll give you all a chance to ask a question or two, depending on how time goes. But I have a meeting that I have another meeting in about 50 minutes. So got to be careful about time today. Um, I came to faith in Christ as a 13 year old. And it was for me a absolute no question. Jesus Christ radically changed my life overnight um, uh, event. Um, Anybody who's familiar with my stories probably heard me talk a little bit about this fear of death that I had when I was a really young child. And then when my neighbors presented the gospel to me, Jesus radically changed me this night and the next day, man, I knew there was something different. So I joined the army while I was still in high school. As you described a little bit about my background, Cody, I spent uh, almost 23 years in the army. I was an enlisted guy, an infantryman for 13 of those 23 years, and then I became an Army chaplain, and I retired from the U.S. Army about five years ago and came on staff at a church the next day. Um, I pastor a church outside of Fort Benning, Georgia, and you have some of the toughest, strongest warriors in the military that will pass through Fort Benning, and a lot of them will get humbled when they're in Fort Benning, and I got humbled a lot when I was at Fort Benning. So um, let me give you a bit about my combat experience for you guys briefly. I spent 10 years consecutively in the Ranger Regiment as an enlisted guy, went to the invasion of Panama in 89, went to Kuwait in Desert Storm in 91. And then as you mentioned, I was part of Task Force Ranger in Somalia in 93. And um, in fact, there's an actor who plays me in the movie Black Hawk Down. Then I became a chaplain in 2000 and uh, by 03 started deploying and did nine combat deployments to Afghanistan and five to Iraq. I'll tell you a couple of, uh, for me, pretty significant events in the Army that really kind of forged me into the man that I am. And some of them I, I, I carry with me to this day. Um, I, was, I was a pretty fast runner when I was growing up. I, I, did, I ran track when I was in middle school and high school, and I was faster than the, than the average guy, but I was never the guy standing on the first place platform. Um, but I was pretty scrawny, so I was tall and thin and pretty fast, but I, I, I really didn't, I, I didn't have much muscle mass, didn't take care of myself. Um, I joined the Army, and I could outrun just about everybody around me, but I struggled real bad with all of the rest of the physical aspects of being in the Army. In fact, for the first couple of weeks in the Army, the, the drill sergeants that I worked for would say, hey, go back through the chow line and go get some more food. You're too small. You're too scrawny and literally made me go eat more than I wanted to, more than I thought my stomach could handle. Um, I almost didn't make it through basic training because of how weak I was, physically weak that I was. I, I couldn't do push-ups very well, couldn't do pull-ups very well, and I started working really hard on my physical abilities. Um, right after finishing infantry training, I went to airborne school, and in airborne school, they're big on your physical abilities, but it's big on pull-ups, which nobody else in the Army really cares about, and so I struggled in airborne school doing pull-ups. And then I tried out for and, uh, and was assigned to the Ranger Regiment. And that's probably the first real physical test where I thought, uh-oh, I don't know if I'm gonna make it, man. These guys, this, this training program is hard enough that 70, 65, 70% 70 of the guys who try out won't make it through the assessment and selection program and won't make it into the Ranger Regiment. So, you know, by God's grace, I made it into the Ranger Regiment. And then one of the most um, important moments of my military career, I was new in the Army. I'd been in the Ranger Regiment for about six or seven months. And uh, I was trying to learn real fast and trying to be the best warrior that I can. Because I realized everything that I do on the battlefield and in church and in life represents Jesus Christ. And if I'm going to represent Christ, I'm going to do it with all that I got. So my, uh, the sergeants that I worked for made the decision about six or seven months into it, hey, we're going to send you off to ranger school. I was stationed in Fort Benning, ranger school is in Fort Benning. Hey, we're going to get you ready and we're going to send you off to ranger school. But in the ranger regiment at that time, it was a, this is an all or nothing thing for you, Jeff. If you don't make it, you don't have a job. 
you fail ranger training and you go somewhere else in the army. And that pressure was not just on me. That pressure was on everybody who went from the ranger regiment. Their, their expectation was you now that you, when you go from our unit to the ranger training, you, we expect you to do well, not just to survive. We expect you to do well. You're representing us. So here's the truth guys. First day, first event, first morning, I'm taking the PT test, the Army's physical fitness test. And the first event of the Army's physical fitness test is push-ups. And I failed. And not only did I fail the push-ups, but the unit decided, we're not even going to give you a second try. We're going to send you right back to your, right back to the, your sergeants and tell them you failed. And they made it really clear to me, hey, Jeff, if you don't pass, you're out. So... I could give you guys to this day five or six reasons why it really wasn't my fault. I mean, I got done, somebody did me wrong and I, you know, this is the common guys will come up with a hundred reasons why it really wasn't their fault. But the bottom line is my, my unit sent me saying you better pass or else you don't have a job. And within an hour of starting the ranger training, I was going, I was making my way back to my unit. So I arrived back across, across the uh, Fort Benning, uh, you know, to my boss and tell him what just happened. And of course he's in shock and uh, he makes me spend the rest of the day, basically in my barracks room by myself before he'll give me an answer. And the answer is, Hey, we're probably going to kick you out, but I'll give you to the rest of the night or the rest of the day. By the end of the duty day, we'll let you know what we're going to do with you next. And I just sat there on my bunk, totally dejected and disappointed. Now, let me give you guys a piece of advice at this point. I think I had one of two, two ways that I could go with this thing. My boss asked me, Jeff, what went wrong? How is it possible? We thought you were ready. How is it possible that we sent you and you failed? And what I really wanted to say is these five or six reasons why I got screwed over and it really wasn't my fault. That's what I wanted to come out of my mouth. But what I knew I needed to say is I'm a man and I'm going to stand up and take responsibility. And I looked him in the eyes and I said, look, there's several things that I could give you, several excuses that I can give you, but I'm not going to. You sent me and you thought I was ready and I failed and I deserve whatever you decide to do with me next. I spent like eight hours sitting on my bunk in my barracks room, not knowing what the unit was going to do with me. And all that I wanted to do is be a ranger. So this for me was devastating. At the end of the day, they said, you know what? We've made the decision that we're going to keep you around Everybody else is telling us we should let you go. But we've made the decision we're going to keep you around and we are going to work you to exhaustion three times a day, every day, until we're ready to send you again. And when we send you again, there will be no doubt that you're ready to pass the Ranger course. That eight hours in my barracks room that day was probably one of the most important moments of my military career because I made a conscious decision, no matter what they decide to do to me, I will never put myself in a position where I'm not physically able to meet the conditions that are put in front of me. In other words, I'm going to make sure I'm physically able to handle whatever the unit or the army or the, or the nation asks of me. And um, that started me on a, that started me on a track of really devoting a lot of my time and energy to becoming as fit of a warrior as I could be. Long, uh, y'all are probably wondering the rest of the story. So I spent about six months, um, three times a day, literally every morning at, at uh, six in the morning, every afternoon at lunchtime and every evening that when everybody else is going home, I'm getting changed and getting ready to go work out again, my third workout of the day for about six months every day, different guy giving me a different workout three times a day. And uh, by the end of that period, I was pretty fit. But you just need to hear this, for the rest of my career, I continue to push my body like those guys pushed me. So when I went to ranger school, I passed the ranger training with flying colors. Now I'm gonna fast forward a couple of years. I'm working in uh, the reconnaissance detachment of the ranger regiment which is kind of guys selected out of the rest of the Ranger Regiment, to, you know, hand selected to go serve in this elite of unit of the elite unit, the Ranger Regiment, the U.S. Army Rangers. And uh, my boss was a winner of the best Ranger competition. Y'all don't know about the best Ranger competition. You need to look it up. It's kind of the Army's Olympics. And one day he was, we were all working out together and he literally just put us through the ringers to see who, what, how, how much we could handle. 
basically it was to see how much he could handle and for him to see how much we could handle. And uh, it was a brutal workout. After it was over with, basically, it was just me and him when the dust settled. And he kind of very casually said, Jeff, you need to try the best ranger competition. Here's my exact words to him. I said, I'm not strong enough. In other words, my muscles aren't big enough to win the best ranger competition. I had this in my mind ever since basic training. I'm not a big guy. I don't have a super, uh, you know, big physique that you see uh, a bunch of those dudes with. And, you know, I'm not the guy you're going to put on the poster of a billboard is what I'm saying. And he said, no, I don't think you get it. You have what it takes to win the best ranger competition. I, I, I tuck this away in the back of my mind. And then finally I decided, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot just to see if I can make it. And 1993, 94 and or 1994, 95 and 96, I competed for three consecutive years in the best ranger competition. And then in 1997, I coached about 10 teams in the best ranger competition. So um, all of those Everything that led up to me doing the best ranger competition came from this moment when I failed the Army's physical fitness test and my unit had every right to kick me out. They should have kicked me out. And I don't know why they didn't kick me out. But it also came to me making the conscious decision, I, I won't allow my body to hold me back anymore. I will push my body and I will, I will set the limits for my body instead of letting my body set the limits on how far and fast I can go. Um, yeah, so you're probably wondering, I competed in 94, 95, came in fourth place both of those years. And then in 1996, Isaac Gamazel and I won the best ranger competition. And I credit all of that to my boss saying, Jeff, you should try it. And all of that to that day that I made the mistake and screwed up and failed the physical fitness test in the first place. And to this day, I try to stay fit. I try to continue to train. I try to make sure that I'm ready for whatever life throws at me. But let's... Let's get spiritual for just a second. This is how the Apostle Paul approaches, approaches life. Like when I was training for the best ranger competition, my unit gave me exclusively, hey, you don't have a job. Your job is to win the best ranger competition. And we're going to give you about three days to, or three months to prepare to win the best ranger competition. All of the resources, all of the equipment, all of the time and the energy, all of the money that you need, we're going to give it to you. But we can't win this thing for you. Um, so I, I kind of, while I was training, I made the decision like the apostle Paul, I press my body. I force my body to go to its extremes. Some days I break my body down to the point that it is, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm worse off from having done this hard workout, but I do it because my body is a tool. And honestly, I want to be an effective tool in the hands of the Lord. So I want you guys to think about it this way. Look, the Lord gave you this physical ability. And if you use this body like a hammer to try to drive a screw, it's going to, I mean, you can, you can put a screw in a wall with a hammer. You can do that if you want. It'll put a screw in the wall, but it's really not the best tool to use to get a screw inside a wall. So Take the body that God has given you. Some of you are fast. Some of you are strong. Some of you are... Um, are physically gifted in other areas, whatever that area is, take it and use it for the glory of God. That's one of my challenges for you. If you sit on the couch and do nothing with your physique, you are allowing your body to set the limits of how far you can go. So I'm going to press you guys a little bit farther now. Maybe the Lord is calling some of you guys in the future to the mission field. Maybe he's going to send you guys somewhere where it's hard and somewhere where you're going to have to walk a lot and it's hot and you don't have any kind of the, you know, the, the modern comforts of life. Are you physically able right now to answer the call of the Lord? Or are you going to stand before God one day in heaven and say, hey, God, I knew in my spirit you were calling me to Africa or Central America. But I was also so physically in, un, incapable of answering that call that I had to say no to what your Holy Spirit was calling me to do. So my challenge for myself and my challenge when I was a leader in the Army to my men is we will always be trained and physically ready for anything that the country may ask of us. Here's how I did this with my men when I was a sergeant. And you guys probably want to thank yourselves that you were never in my unit because when my guys 
uh, worked out in the morning. We typically stayed longer and worked harder than any of the rest of the guys in the unit. When we take a long weekend, I would send those guys away on a long weekend and say, have a great time, man. You guys, I really mean this. Enjoy yourself. Blow off some steam. You've worked hard. You deserve it. But you need to know this. When we come back from this long weekend, we're going to run 10 miles together. And we're going to run 10 miles at a tough pace. So if you want to spend the whole weekend eating pizza and getting fat, you can. But we're going to be, we're going to run together. You know, as soon as the weekend's over with, we're going to run together for 10 miles. And if you can't make it way out in the woods, we leave no man behind. Uh, Cody's probably heard, you've heard this from Cody more than once, which means if you can't make it way out in the woods, I'm going to put you on my shoulders and I'm going to run you back on my shoulders until we get back to the barracks. And more than once on a 10 mile run after a four day weekend, I am running a guy on my shoulders back to the barracks because he uh, abused his body on the weekend and uh, spent the whole weekend drinking and eating pizza and getting fat and just wasn't ready for what was coming on Monday. But here's the point that you need to hear. When we were training in some really difficult environments, the guys that I worked with, my men were able to move farther and to make it uh, to, to last longer and to move farther than anybody else in my unit. Literally, we were doing some training here in Fort Benning. It was in the middle of August. It was in the middle of the afternoon. And we decided we're going to try to move by foot from the training area back to our base. And uh, the temperatures were well over 100 degrees. We were carrying uh, about, uh, about 100 pounds of equipment. The entire unit started. And at the end of the day, the only guys that were able to make it across the finish line literally was my unit. The rest of the entire unit had to get picked up on vehicles and brought by vehicles back to the uh, to our base at the at the end of the day because it was too hot and too exhausting for most of the rest of the guys. I tell my men after that was over with, I attribute that to the hard training that we did together. And we you, you beat your body up and you prepared your body to do whatever it, uh, it was needed to do. And then I remind my men, look, we don't know where we're going to end up. The thing about Rangers is it's a rapid deployment unit that can go anywhere in the world tomorrow. So we don't know where we're going to go. And we got to be ready for anything at any moment. And that kind of lifestyle is, is demanding. It's unrelenting. But on a spiritual battlefield, man, you don't know what the Lord is going to throw at you tomorrow. So guys, are you physically ready for anything that the Lord asks of you? Literally. If he asks you to sell it all and to go preach in Africa, can you physically meet those, that, that uh, request from the Lord right now? Obviously, his Holy Spirit's going to give you the strength, but he's not going to, the Holy Spirit's not going to undo all of those years of, you know, abuse to your body. So guys, I want to challenge you on this one, really. Be physically ready for anything that the Lord asks of you. And then when he asks you, you can say, yeah, I'm ready. I also think this may be off the subject a little bit, but you also need to be financially ready. Like, is your personal finances, your family so jacked up financially that if God asked you, if God was calling you to go do something radical, you would have to say to him, God, I'm sorry, I can't do that because I can't afford it. Now, of course, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Our father owns every, all of the resources. So it's not like he can't supernaturally provide the, the, finances for you to do it. But if he called you tomorrow, are you financially capable of stepping away tomorrow and following him? And if not, guys, get yourself financially fit, get yourself physically fit. But both of those two things, even if you have, even if you're in excellent financial physical shape, even if your finances are superb right now, man, I really want to challenge you guys for a few minutes about your walk with Christ. So are you in a place spiritually right now where you would hear from him if he was calling you into the dark and asking you to take a huge step of faith? Here for me was one of the most significant moments of my military career. I was a, an enlisted guy for 13 years. I was fast tracking through the ranks as an enlisted guy. In fact, um, I was a sergeant first class at about 10 years. It was, it was inevitable. I was going to end up at the highest rank in, in, as a sergeant in the Army. And, I mean, my career path was pretty much on that track. And, and most of the guys around me knew it. This is true of a lot of Rangers, frankly. Those guys move fast through the ranks, and they go to the highest levels in the military. And I was kind of on that career track. And then in Somalia, this absolutely overwhelming sense that the Lord was calling me to the ministry happened. And it happened after this big firefight. 
and I wrestled with this probably for six months or so, like, God, I don't want to do this. I, I know, I think I know deep inside what you're asking me to do, but I really don't want to do it. And then finally, he kind of overwhelmingly showed me, Jeff, I don't care if you want to do it or not. This is what I'm calling you to do. Go do it. And so for me, the big struggle became, well, now how do I tell my friends who all know me as this sergeant, door kicker, you know, uh, winner of the best stranger company, how am I going to tell these guys that I'm going to go to, the, that God is calling me into the ministry? And I, I'm ashamed to say there was, I spent some, a couple of months where I just didn't have the courage to tell my friends. I'd already, I already knew there's no question God's calling me into the ministry, but I didn't want to say it to them because I didn't, you know, I, I valued how they viewed me so much. And this is guys, we're all guilty of this. I mean, we will go to the extreme so that we look good in our buddy's eyes. I mean, a man's ego will propel him to do some outrageous and ridiculous things. And one day I got up and I just bit the bullet and I decided I got to go tell my, I got to go tell my friends and here's what's worse. I got to go tell my boss. He was offering me, Hey Jeff, here's the deal. I want to give you this premier job in the Ranger Regiment. And it was at that point that I realized, uh Oh, I got to go tell my boss. I can't take that job. And nobody says no to their boss, especially when he's offering you this premier job. And I got to tell him why I can't tell, take the job. So at the time, my regimental sergeant major was a guy by the name of Mike Hall, who I consider one of America's greatest warriors to this day. Um, I went into Sergeant Major Mike Hall's office and I said, Sergeant Major, I thank you for the offer. It was, you didn't have to offer that to me. Frankly, I don't even think that I'm worthy of the offer, the job offer that you're offering me. And he was basically saying, this is what your career is going to do after this, if you take this job. And I said, I, I'm sorry, I can't take it. And he was kind of frustrated with me, not angry, but frustrated. So he said, why? And I said, truth is, I'm pretty convinced the Lord is calling me into the ministry. And I, I think I'm going to have to leave the Rangers, which he did not want to hear. And he started trying to say, Jeff, what does it take to keep you around? Okay, don't take this job. What does it take to keep you around the Rangers? And I said, I don't think you get it, Sergeant Major. If I stay in the Rangers and keep doing what I'm doing, I'm disobeying the Lord. I got to follow God. And there's no question he's calling me into the ministry. And it was like a switch flipped. This I will never forget. And to this day, I, uh, I think very highly of my call. Because at that moment, he basically said, okay, what do you need from me to help you be successful? I did not expect that. I expected him to throw me out of his office. I expected him to... To, you know, to give me the hard sell to do whatever it took to keep me around the Rangers. And he said, Jeff, if this is what the Lord is calling you to do, tell me what you need me to do to help you be successful. I said, do you really mean that? And he said, yes, I really mean it. And I said, you need to help me get a job where I can get a seminary education. I was already working on an undergraduate degree. And I said, I, I'm almost done with my undergraduate degree in the Ranger Regiment, but I need seminary. And I can't pull that off while I'm here. So would you help me find a job? And he, he got on the phone literally while I was still in his office and started making phone calls while I was in his office, helping me find the job. So now the next morning, I'm at the dining facility and word is rippling across the dining facility like waves in a pool. People are saying, did you hear about Struker? While well, I'm sitting right next to them. Did you hear what Struker just did? He's going to be a missionary. And I said, guys, I didn't say I was going to be a missionary. I said ministry. They said, yeah, whatever. It's missionary ministry. It's all the same thing. This is how lost rangers are. And I said, look, man, the Lord is calling me into the ministry, and I got to follow where he's leading me. And I, I think if I were hanging on to my career so tightly, I would have not listened to the Lord, and I would have, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. I'll give you a marksmanship principle that was going through my mind while this, while I was struggling with the call to the Lord. Um, when I was training guys how to fire machine guns and when I, especially when I was training them how to fire the rifle, um, the guys that would hold on to the rifle too tight would almost always be able to hit the target maybe once or twice, but out of 10 shots, they would miss eight out of 10. And it would be counterintuitive, but I would have to show them, convince them, you have to hang on to the rifle. 
but you have to hang on kind of loosely, especially with your non-firing hand. You got to let it sit there kind of loosely. If you hang on too tight, the muscle is going to pull the rifle off of the target. And I started to realize, Jeff, you were doing this for a while with your Army career. You were hanging on so tight that you almost couldn't let go when God was calling you to do something. When he was redirecting you to another target, you were, you were hanging on so tight that you almost couldn't let go. And I kind of uh, made a commitment. All right, God, whatever you, call, whatever you ask of me next, I'm going to hang on loosely. And if you want me to give something up now, if you want me to give up what I'm doing now to go do something different, I'm your servant. I will go where you send me. So if it costs me my career, if it costs me my reputation, even if it costs me my friends, I'm hanging on to those things loosely because I want to be an accurate, I want to be an accurate warrior for you and for your kingdom, which means I got to be willing to let some things go if you ask me to let them go. And these are some good things. I mean, I dearly love my friends and God was calling me to go away and to do something different. So when I left the Ranger Regiment, when I was kind of driving away, and I have, I loved serving with Rangers. It was the joy of my life. I drove away going to seminary and teaching ROTC at the same time. That's the job that my Sergeant Major hooked me up with, premier job. And I asked the Lord in a prayer, God, would you give me the privilege of going back to serve as a chaplain to the Rangers one day? If you do that, I'll die a happy man. And, uh, Got a chance to become an Army chaplain, went to the 82nd Airborne Division, did a long deployment with them. And then the Ranger Regiment called me and said, hey, we'd like for you to try out again, like all over again, try out again. And I became a Ranger Battalion chaplain and got the privilege to serve most of the rest of my career as a chaplain in the Ranger Regiment. And some of the dudes that I served with were the same guys that I was a sergeant with. Now I'm their chaplain. And uh, those guys would say to their friends, hey, man, you can trust this guy. He's been there, done that. He's not a guy who read about it in a book, man. He's a guy who's been there and done that. And in fact, I was there with him on the battlefield, and I can vouch for who he is and what he did on the battlefield. So God gave me some incredible opportunities as an Army chaplain that many chaplains wouldn't get because of all of the stuff that I, I did in combat before becoming a chaplain. So a couple things about my story, guys. Um, I'll give you a little, uh, I hope you already have this mindset. I think Cody's already building this into you. And many of you probably, uh, you know, heard about Cody with this mindset, but here's something that special operators get paid to do. Um, when the rest of the military goes to war, they go to war in big groups and typically they try to overwhelm the enemy with a lot of bullets and a lot of bodies. And we'll just either throw more bodies at the enemy or we'll just throw more bullets at the enemy that at the end of the day, we should be victorious. Now it's not that um, commanders don't do their best to try to mitigate the um, amount of people that may die on a battlefield, but it's generally, we go to war with lots of people. Special operators don't. Generally speaking, special operators operate in small units, very small units. Many of them operate behind enemy lines. And most of them know if I get into a big fight, I'm going to be severely outnumbered. So what you have to train a special operator to do, what you have to train special forces warriors to do, is when the guns, when the enemy starts firing, the natural reaction is we're too small, they're too big, we need to run away. And there are some tactical scenarios where you're too small, the enemy is too strong, you better run away. Let's just make this um, spiritual for a second. In the case of sexual temptation, my guess is you're too strong, the enemy is too powerful, run away. Don't stand and fight, run away. But it's it becomes a, the, the challenge in the beginning to train uh, special forces warriors is you have to cause them to say, even though we're small and even though the army may be strong, the, the enemy may be stronger than us. Instead of running away from the sound of the guns, we're going to run to the sound of the guns. Man, I've had the privilege to work with uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines that are special operators from the U S and universally they all do the same thing. When the bullets start flying, they are the first people to run to the sound of the guns. Everybody else runs away or they put their head down. And the few moments that a special operator runs to the sound of the guns is generally the decisive moment of a battle. And if they would have waited, 
or hesitated or ran away, they would never get that fight back or many of them would not be alive today. So I, my, my, one of my great honors is to be able to work with a lot of warriors who when the bullets were flying around us, I had no question. They would run to the sound of the guns to protect me. And they knew I would run to the sound of the guns to protect them. It's a little bit about me, a little bit about my background, guys. Cody, I don't know if we can pull this off, but I want to give guys a chance to ask some questions. So is, is there a way that you can give these, some of those guys, unmute some of those mics and give them a chance to ask some questions? Yeah. Oh, man, Jeff, so good. Uh, so encouraging to our hearts. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, we can. So guys on the call, uh, you guys want to ask a question, just unmute yourself. Uh, ask the question, and as soon as you're done, just mute the mic again, uh, because I have this recording, so it will go back and record Jeff's talk. So, yeah, uh, definitely. I'm going to mute myself, and guys, fire away. Anybody? Hey, oh, Go for it. John? Yeah, hey, Jeff. It's a real privilege to hear this, and I just wanted to share with you um, – you're just such an inspiration, um, and I, I appreciate your your heart and how you've shared with us today. And I, I but I wanted to share something with you also. Um, I am a um, I love the Lord, and I am I coach leaders in a ministry, and I'm a corporate executive who moved into coaching recently. But my leadership motto has been I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, sure can run toward the gunfire. One of my coaches who runs a, a ministry for young men gave that to me here a few weeks ago. He's adopted it as well. So I, I, um, I just appreciate your heart and I want you to know that I've learned a lot from this is a, this is something I adopted 10 years ago to press me and push me to, to, to run into the battle, to take it on without even thinking almost, just responsibly go into it. And what you find is when you're trusting in the Lord, he will, he will bring to you what you need at that, at that moment of time. And so anyway, I just wanted to just take a moment to thank you. I don't have any questions really, but you're an inspiration. Thank you for taking the time to share with us. Well, thanks, John. And I want to say something about that comment. Um, John, thanks for the way that you're leading other men. Men need to be challenged by other men. In fact, I make this statement to guys around uh, our church all the time. It, it takes a man to call the man out of another man. In other words, your mama can't do it. Your wife shouldn't be the one doing it for you. You need another man to call this out of you. But I will say the same thing that you have in your motto to the men of our church. I will say, guys, God created you to be the leader. Not a leader, but the leader, especially in your home. So they hear this from me regularly. When something goes bump in the night, your wife doesn't get up to figure out what's going bump in the night. You get up and you go find out what's going bump in the night. And I know you just want to pull the covers over your head because it's scary. I know that because I am too. I'm scared too. But when something goes wrong in your house, that's your domain. You got put you in this family to protect it. And if something goes bump in the night, you get up and you go figure out what goes wrong. I hope you got a, a gun or two in your house to protect your family, or at least you know how to use your hands to protect them. But I would say when a guy is doing battle and you've heard from Cody enough, man, life in America has become a spiritual battle. Whatever you're, wherever you work, chances are your workplace is a spiritual battle. A guy needs another brother in arms. You never run to the sound of the guns by yourself. You always got another dude on your right or on your left who's running to the guns with you. And you know, if this fight gets hairy, I got another guy that I can lean on. So I hope you guys have that kind of brother in arms that will run to the guns with you. But John, thanks for bringing that up. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Hey, Jeff. My name is Ted. Um, hearing your story has been super inspiring. And I'm going into the Navy at the end of this summer. Um, because I want to do ministry in the military. And so I'm just kind of curious what it looked like for you to live your faith out in the army, especially in special warfare where all the, it's a very elite group. And I imagine it's pretty tough to be a witness for Christ in that area. Ted, first of all, thanks for tuning in today. Secondly, thanks for being willing to sign up and to join the Navy and to serve the country. And I always want to honor a warrior. 
but uh, you've, you've got a leg up uh, that on me. I didn't realize how challenging spiritually serving in the military would be. I mean, everybody, everywhere out there, there's no real solid spiritual work environment anymore, unless you work in a church. And even then, even then, I don't know how spiritual it is sometimes, but in the military, it's a challenge. And if you find yourself in special operations in the military, it can be a pretty extreme challenge. In other words, you may feel like a total loner, a total outsider. When those days happen, and I promise you, they're going to happen if you end up in the military where you're going to feel like, man, I'm here to try to serve Jesus. And it feels like I'm the only one. Um, I think back to Isaiah, like in the Old Testament, remember when Isaiah got super discouraged and he's, he's on the run and Jezebel wants to kill him and he's up in the mountains and he's throwing a pity party for himself. Basically, he's whining and he's saying, God, I'm the only dude left who's trying to honor you. And God's like, no, you're not. I got 7,000 more just like you. Um, those words kind of came to my mind when I felt like, God, it feels like I'm the only dude out here trying to honor you in the army or in the Ranger Regiment. And he's reminding me, no, you're not. I got a lot more just like you don't know them. But secondly, I do say this to warriors. I say this to all of you guys. If you work or if you go to school or if you're living in this really dark spiritual environment right now and you're trying to be a light shining for Jesus, your light shines brightest in the darkest environment. And when it gets dark around you, people cannot help. You are compelled to look at the light when it's dark. So, Ted, I'm telling you, man, it's going to be hard. I'm promising you it's going to be hard to live out your faith in an environment like that. But I'm also promising you, if you do it, you're going to get a lot of people looking at you. And God willing, you'll make a big impact on them. So don't let the darkness of the spiritual environment that you're in stop you from being a bright light shining for Jesus. All right. What else, guys? I uh, wanted to ask. It, I, I've been having. I, I was a firefighter for fourteen years, and uh, you know, we kind of had the same motto. We we were the ones running in, as everybody else was running out. Um, and that was years ago. Uh, I'm disabled now. And I've been having this, um, I guess, fear. And I, I was just, you know, wanting to see if you could touch on that, if, if you had any, um, any, you know, uh, feelings about that. Yeah, it's a Dalton. Is that your name? It's Tim. I'm using my oh, son's. All right, Tim. <laughs> my son's iPad. Um, is it fear in general or is it, is there some, is the fear specifically geared towards something that you're struggling with right now? No, it's just a, a general fear. Um, like I said, I'm disabled now and, um, you know, the, the challenge that Cody's doing and everything, uh, is, is really tough for me because of all my other challenges. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's the, the fear is not maybe not being able to finish, maybe, you know, not giving it my best. I, I'm not sure Yeah. at this point. So I, I want to applaud you for being courageous enough. Listen to the, the language that I'm using right now, being courageous enough to admit your fear. Really, it's a coward who says, oh, no, I'm good. I don't have any fear. Yeah, you do. Every sane, rational man has fear. I used to say this about warriors getting ready to go into combat. If you look me in the eyes and you say, I'm not afraid right now, Sergeant, or I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of the next combat deployment, Chaplain, I don't want you with me. That's not good. That's not healthy. In fact, America doesn't need a warrior on the battlefield that doesn't have any fear. Fear is a powerful motivator, but it can also destroy you if you let it. And so I think you've got to, ra you got to run the razor's edge with fear. You have to allow fear to motivate you to greatness, allow fear to push you to the point that you didn't think you could go. Um, but don't let fear overwhelm you. And that happens deep inside you. Like you, you, you can find some brothers that will help try to help, that will try to help you, but it's you struggling with you when it comes to fear. 
here's how powerful the motivator fear is. I used to tell, I used to have the job to prepare guys for the Ranger Regiment, the very job that I almost failed as a private, the um, Rangers gave me when I was a Sergeant First Class. And I had only a few weeks with them. So I would say, guys, my job is to make sure that you're ready to go to the Ranger Regiment. And ultimately, my job is to make sure you're ready to go to combat with this unit and you won't hold us back. It's only a couple of weeks that I have with you. And so this is the language that I used with them. There's really two ways to do this. I can either make you fear me or I can make you love me. I would prefer to have you love me, but I don't have enough time. So you're going to have to fear me. And just trust me, if you will have appropriate amount of fear, the right amount of fear, and listen to what I tell you, you'll make it through this program. And more importantly, you'll be ready for combat when it happens. Not if, but when it happens. Fear is a healthy thing. Fear is a good thing. But fear can be incapacitating if you let, you, if you let it. Many times I did some Army training that I didn't know when I started. I may not make it. This training is so tough. Most guys won't make it. And I had that fear. What if I start it and I don't make it? And I made the decision, you know what? I'm going to give it everything that I've got. I will hold nothing back physically, emotionally, spiritually. I'm going to give it all that I've got. And if I don't make it, then I can at least drive away saying I failed, but I failed given it all that I've got. And if I make it, I'll, uh, you know, I can, I can say that, you know, I, it, it, I gave the program or the course all that I have. And more than once, guys, I failed some training in the Army and had to do what I call the drive of shame, going back home saying, hey, I didn't make it, but I gave it all that I got. So that fear can motivate you in a good way if you let it, but it can also hold you back if you let it. And um, don't forget, man, Cody has said this to you all, I know. God did not give us a spirit of fear. So fear is normal. Fear is healthy, but fear can also incapacitate you. And when fear is incapacitating you, you are not operating in faith because the antidote to fear is not courage. The antidote to fear is faith. Fear says there's something in the future that's unknown, and I don't know how it's going to turn out. And faith says, I don't know the future, but I do know the one who holds my future, and I'm trusting him. That's good. Thank you for your service also. Uh, great question, man. Got a few more minutes with you guys. So any other questions? Maybe five more minutes with y'all? Cody, anything that you still want to hear from me? Anything that you'd like for me to, to talk about before we sign off? You know, I, I just want to encourage the guys um, with a couple of things that you just said. Um, some people come to me and I'm sure Jeff they asked you this, uh, just on the basis of fear. And a lot of these young speakers will come and they'll say, Hey man, how do I get to the point to where I don't fear public speaking? And I tell them, if you get there, you're never going to make it as a public communicator because it's the fear that will keep you up preparing. It's the fear of failure that in stewarding God's word correctly that Paul used in Philippians say, man, I worship God with fear and trembling. This idea of I want to make sure I'm as prepared as I can be because if people lose that feeling of the sense of fear, they're, they start to become really dangerous for the gospel's sake. So I love what you said there. Thank you. Um, I want you to really, I would love to, for, uh, we, we, have, we have four minutes left, um, but I love what you said, Jeff, about there's some battles where we can storm the gates of hell. And we're like teaching and cultivating a heart of special forces soldiers to say, let's go. Um, but I have a philosophy constantly. If you walk into the room and there's a temptress naked wanting to have sex with you, don't sit down and share the gospel with her. Right. <laughs> Run. Um, and what you said was really neat. I would love for, um, if you don't mind, just to really speak into our hearts with that, with the area of pornography, with virtual reality pornography coming, with just affairs and um, man, I'd love, cause I, I love that. Like that is not a fight head on. We should fight um, without completely running away and fighting it from a long distance with yeah. brothers. Cody, you're, you hit the nail on the head and I'm glad you guys have in this forum have the ability to talk about this. Honestly, let's face it. Many guys are hiding in the shadows and they wish they could say what, what you guys are hearing, but nobody's saying it with them and they don't have anybody to share it with. And uh what Cody is saying is the absolute truth, man. There are some fights you cannot win that fight. And I know one of those fights. I don't even know who you are and I don't know where you're at, but I know a fight you can't win. It's you fighting you. 
you fight in your flesh, you will lose that fight every time. So here's how you make sure you don't get in the battle to the point that you're so entrenched that you know you're going to lose and there's no good way out. Basically, this is going to cost you everything. So you got to protect yourself before you even, uh, before the guns start going off. In other words, no, the enemy is over there. And because the enemy is over there, I'm skirting that territory. Here's how I do it. I never, ever get in alone in a vehicle. In the last 20 years, the only woman I've ever been alone in a vehicle with was my son's fiance after they had proposed and she had been around our family for years. And I told her, you're the first woman, I've not in my family, the first woman I've been in the same vehicle with alone in 20 years. And it's only because you're about to marry my son in the next few months. Um, I don't go somewhere with a lady. I don't meet a lady somewhere. But for me, it's not good enough not to be put. Like, the truth is, if I don't, if I'm not private and alone with a woman, then I'm probably not going to have sex with her, right? Nobody has sex in a crowded restaurant in the middle of the afternoon. That's just not going to happen. But I, I take it a step further. I go to the point that I won't even allow somebody to make an assumption that something's going on. So I don't show up where there's a lady by herself. I don't, I don't, I don't put myself in those situations because I don't want another woman calling my wife and saying, Hey, you, I saw your husband today, today. You know what he was doing that? Like, I don't ever even want to give that opportunity to happen, but here's that's, you know, another woman in public kind of thing. Now let's just get honest about the computer in private, move your computer somewhere where any time of the day, somebody can walk by and see what you're doing and only get on computer when there's people in the house. It, it, look, if you can't fight this battle and you know you can't win it, get rid of the internet. Get rid of the cable television in your house. You're better off with no internet, better with no cable television than it's so entrenched in sexual sin that you can't find your way out. But place your computer somewhere in your house where if you are uh, on the computer any time of the day, somebody can walk by and see what you're doing. And that way, somebody knows you, they know what you're doing, and, and uh, you're kind of trying to keep yourself accountable. Those are just ways of making sure. Ask your wife to check up on you. Literally, give her your phone and ask her, hey, check it and see what I'm looking at on my phone. Here's all my passwords. Here's all my account numbers so that she can see it and so that you're being above board. And you've got to have a, bat a battle buddy in this one. You need another dude who is as real and as raw with you about his struggles as you can be with him. Don't let that be your wife. Doesn't need to be another lady. It needs to be a dude who's struggling like you are and willing to hold you accountable. So just some quick thoughts, Cody, on that one. Man, praise God. Um, guys, uh, please let that sink in that you're hearing from one of the baddest special forces operators this country has, um, has had. And now for the kingdom, he is and he's telling you and I'm pleading with you, you are not strong enough to handle that. Um, so don't fight it, flee from it, protect right. yourself, get blocks on your devices. And exactly what Jeff said, get a battle buddy. I'll have a guy one time a week. He'll ask me, how are you doing with pornography, with masturbation, with your thought life? And he'll ask me the questions. No man will just come up to me and ask me. Um, but I give him access to do that. And he has the authority in my life because my purity is worth the war that I will fight on the internal battle constantly. So, um, man, Jeff, that's so good to say, like, man, in Christ, we can do all things. Right. Uh, in Christ, there's areas that we shouldn't even go into those battlefields. Yeah. Um, and we have to know that because some guys are like, man, I'm strong enough. Like, I'm a, I'm a warrior for Christ. I can sit down and have a lunch with this girl. She's just in ministry. And that deception is the start of something that could become a prideful heart. That's the affair that will cost you your ministry, man. Oh, and you just, um, so I love Modesto Manifesto. That's what Billy Graham adopted where he would never, and I, I know, you know this, a lot of guys know this, but he would never ride with a woman alone, meet with a woman alone for lunch, do that. And guys, we have to take it with that level of seriousness because Satan is scheming against us to shut our mouth, to destroy our legacy. And he wants, he knows he won't win the war, but he wants to win the battle. Um, so, um, Jeff, man, thank you. What a blessing. What hey, a you blessing. guys are great, man. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to your guys, Cody. And I hope yeah, that the yeah. Lord blesses you guys. Hey, thank you. Have a great day. And all the guys on, love you guys. We'll talk to you soon. We'll see you. See ya. Thank you, guys.